When it comes to sneakers these days, people tend to use the word iconic a little too much. What does iconic even mean? A cultural icon can be a logo, a person, a building, or yes, even a sneaker. It represents a concept or a movement with great cultural significance to our society. Very few sneakers reach this kind of status, but when it comes to the Adidas Superstar, I think we can all agree that this is a true cultural icon. But hey, if this is your first time here, I'm Nacho, me and my brother Brian, we make videos on sneaker culture and sneaker history. And if you enjoy this kind of content, consider subscribing. Let's get to it. In 1960, Adidas' main focus was track and field sporting equipment. During the Olympics of 1960, which took place in Rome, Adidas was the dominant brand among athletes. 75% of contestants were wearing the three stripes. Track and field legend Wilma Rudolph took the gold in Rome while wearing a pair of Adidas track shoes. The brand's dominance of the sporting world carried on all throughout the decade of the 1960s. The 1968 Olympics in Mexico saw 85% of athletes wearing Adidas. In fact, athletes wearing Adidas products took home 37 gold medals, 35 silver medals, and 35 bronze. This was the lay of the land in 1964 when Adidas began developing basketball shoes. Horst Dossler, son of Adidas founder Adi Dossler, decided to focus his efforts on the American market. He was frustrated with his parents' development strategies for the business and wanted to expand the brand at a larger scale. Horst had huge ambitions for Adidas when he arrived in America. He consulted with Adidas U.S. marketing advisor Chris Severin, who told Horst that basketball shoes hadn't changed since the early 1900s and that the industry was mostly dominated by canvas-based designs like Converse's All-Stars and Pro Keds's Royals. These type of shoes provided minimal support and caused a lot of players to injure their ankles and knees. Adidas worked closely with Severin to design a brand new concept for basketball shoes. A leather shell sole design which provided an amazing herringbone sole to grip the court, improved stability, and was 30% lighter than other shoes. The final addition, which would become the shoe's defining feature, was the shell toe. The shell toe was designed to slow down wear and tear in the forefoot area of the shoe. The shoe was released in 1964 and was named the Super Grip. Alongside the release of the Super Grip was a high top version of the shoe, the Pro Model. At first, the shoes didn't sell very well at all, mostly due to skepticism because canvas shoes were the norm back then. Coaches and players could not wrap their heads around a leather basketball shoe and who could blame them? They were used to wearing Chuck Taylors because that's all they knew. It was the standard basketball shoe back then. It wasn't until San Diego Rockets coach Jack McMahon decided to take a chance on the Super Grip that it would see any use. It took some convincing, but once he got his team to wear the Super Grip, they were ecstatic. By the end of the season, many teams had noticed the Rockets' new shoes and they wanted in. When the Boston Celtics won the NBA championships in 1969 while wearing the Superstars, the Three Stripes was launched to the forefront of basketball wear. About 85% of all pro players in the United States switched over to Adidas. At some point between 1965 and 1969, the Adidas Super Grip got a full makeover, which included a name change to the Adidas Superstar and the distinct shell toe that we know today. The introduction of the Superstar simultaneously boosted overall business for Adidas and left Converse in the dust. By the early 1970s, basketball shoes accounted for 10% of overall Adidas sales. And as Adidas began to scale, Converse quickly found themselves struggling. By the end of the decade, the Converse All-Star, which was the number one basketball shoe for years, would be phased out by Adidas. Within two years of the Superstar's introduction, Adidas not only carved out its own space in the market, they began to destroy their competition. In 1976, Chris Severin convinced Horst Dossler that Adidas needed a Superstar to go with the Superstar. Back then, the obvious choice was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the biggest star in basketball of that era. Horst agreed to pay Jabbar a then record-breaking $25,000 a year to endorse the shoe. Over the next few years, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would become the face of Adidas basketball. Eventually, the Adidas Superstar technology would be surpassed by other basketball shoe innovations, but the Adidas Superstar's usefulness and popularity would not die. Thanks to the budding world of hip-hop, the Superstar would find its true calling and achieve new levels of popularity as a lifestyle sneaker. In the early 1980s, hip-hop was developing at a rapid pace. Africa Bambara released his first single, and Curtis Blow, the first rapper to appear on national television, released The Break. The record went on to sell more than a million copies, and hip-hop gradually evolved into big business. Legendary photographer Jamal Shabazz captured the New York scene perfectly during this era. His photographs show us a world where streetwear fashion was dominated by Kanglo hats and boombox. His work captures the essence of hip-hop, and I highly suggest you check out his photos if you want to learn more about early hip-hop fashion. Fast forward to 1985 and Run DMC is the biggest hip-hop act in the world. 
The group is selling out arenas and quickly becomes the first rap group to have certified gold and platinum albums. They were the first rap group to have its video played on MTV, appear on the cover of Rolling Stone, and the only rap group to perform at Live Aid in 1985. You see, before Run DMC, there was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and they rocked leather jackets, almost like a glam rock band would. Run DMC became the first hip hop group to dress like people from the block. From head to toe, Run DMC sported three stripes, from Adidas tracksuits to shell toe superstars. Their rise to fame sparked a movement. And in no time, fans were emulating their favorite artist's style and showing up to sold out Run DMC concerts, rocking laceless Adidas superstars and tracksuits. In 1986, the trio had just dropped their groundbreaking third album, Raising Hell, and were performing at Madison Square Garden. Leor Cohen, their road manager at the time, had invited Angelo Anastasio, an Adidas executive, to the show. Anastasio was struck by the sight of 10,000 fans lifting their Adidas sneakers into the air. The Adidas exec reportedly rushed back to the Adidas headquarters, and within days, Run DMC became the first hip-hop group to receive a multi-million dollar endorsement deal with a sportswear company. The rest is history, and here's what Run DMC had to say about it. I think their relationship with Adidas legitimized our culture. Because before it happened, people said it's just a fad, rap is just a fad, it's negative, not good, nobody will ever like it. So our relationship with Adidas legitimized us. What had been set in motion in the 1980s would soon resonate even harder in the 1990s. The Beastie Boys wore throwback Adidas shoes on their cover of their 1992 Check Your Head album, and the Superstar 2 was released. The only difference between the Superstar 1 and the Superstar 2 was improved material and a thick padded tongue. As the 1990s entered the 2000s, skaters like Keith Huffnagel and Mark Gonzalez skated the Superstar. The Superstar's signature shell toe was a no-brainer for skateboarding. It was nearly built for withstanding the constant scraping of the grip tape. Skaters benefited from the extra longevity and protection the shell toe provided. The explosion of hip-hop and skateboarding culture coincided perfectly with the beginning of modern-day streetwear culture. In 2003, Nigo, the founder of Babe, cemented himself into the Adidas Superstar legacy by using the silhouette as a canvas. The release of the camel printed and yellow sold Super Ape Star caused big hype and to this day is a sought after shoe. Over the last 40 years, the Adidas Superstar has been released in nearly every colorway imaginable and there has been countless collaborations with artists and designers, way too many to start name dropping. Despite massive retro releases from Jordan every year, innovative new products from Nike and boost equipped sneakers from Adidas, the Superstar continues to outsell them all, 40 years from its original release. A true icon. The shoe is timeless and I'm convinced it will remain relevant for another 50 years. All right guys, so I'm hoping you liked that video. Uh, we're trying to mix it up, you know, different brands. This time we did an Adidas shoe. You know, we can't just keep doing Nike. We've been getting a ton of great feedback from all of our history videos. So I appreciate all you guys tuning in and watching. Like the video, subscribe, share it. It would really mean the world to us. And uh, we appreciate every single one of you. Anyways, peace. On to the next one. Oh,